Right, it's another Instagram Live happy hour. If you caught what I did earlier in the week, it was with David Perel, and we did a Zoom, and we did it for so long uh, that there were so many questions, but so many people there that we couldn't possibly answer all the questions. You know, like, what a good problem to have. So we decided to do a bonus Instagram Live together where I took some of the questions uh, that we didn't get a chance, hey Spencer, <laughs> uh, I didn't get a chance to, uh, that we didn't get a chance to answer then. And I also had you submit some before. Uh, if you have any questions that you wanna answer, make sure that we answer. You've got that little question thing right there. You can uh, submit some of those. We're really just gonna try to get through as many of them as possible. Uh, if you don't know who David is, he's a writer, he's a podcaster, and he's the founder of something called Rite of Passage. He is a phenomenal writer, and the way that we connected was because of his Twitter presence and his ability to write, to synthesize, uh, and so that's what kind of got us connected. And so we'll want to talk to him about what are some of the ways that he writes, how did he grow his following, and he's, if you missed what we did on Zoom, we'll give a kind of a little brief update on that, but for the most part, it's going to be all new content. Um, you know, talk a little bit about some of the stuff that we didn't get a chance to talk to last time. So let me see if I can get him on here. And it takes just a second. And as always, it's a happy hour. So cheers, guys. If you're drinking, hope you enjoy. Hey, hey, what's going on? David, how you doing? Good. You got the wine out, huh? I do. Yeah. Last time it was kind of a coincidence. This time it was, uh, you know, I just wanted a glass of wine. Nice. Nice. Well, round two. Let's yeah. do it, man. What, I'm, what a, I'm, what a I'm good psyched. problem to have that we had, that so many people ask questions that we couldn't possibly get through them in like 90 minutes. Exactly. And for all of you, hi, I'm David. And I know Matthew just, thanks for the introduction, my friend. And if you have any questions, write them in the chat. As we go along, we'll be happy to answer them. We really have no agenda. And my goal is just to say as many things about Twitter and social media and writing that I've never said before in the next hour. I love it. So I've got a few uh, stuff that I just want to write because I actually don't know this about you. So I've just got like two or three questions yeah. uh, to get through. And then I've got a whole bunch of others that we can run through. Uh, so one, how did you get started writing? Tell me about like, write a passage, what you're doing, like, why are you such a good writer? Because you are a good writer, if, if, you know, I'll just say it. So how did this all happen? So I was a horrible writer growing up, like, actually awful. And I don't say that modestly. Like, I was literally terrible at writing. Like, it's a joke in the family. How are you a writing teacher? Mm -hmm. But I think that very often, good teachers aren't actually good at what they do. So mm -hmm. I don't think, or, or art actually didn't have natural talent for what they do. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not like the Tiger Woods of writing. I was not a two-year-old with a typewriter in my hand actually doing this well. I got horrible grades all the way through college in writing and outside of writing. And what happened, Matthew, is I was really frustrated in my inability to write. And it was for a couple reasons. First and foremost was that when I, so I was working in sales and advertising agency, and I just wasn't doing a good enough job writing to please my boss. And that was really frustrating. And so there was an external reason of, hey, you got to actually become a better writer. But then also something changed in the last 10 years where people are media companies. You can turn on Instagram Live and in four minutes have 80 people watching you and hundreds, maybe thousands of people, actually thousands of people have already watched what we did on Wednesday. And so basically the reach of the written word, which has always been great, but that has been for people who have had the privilege to have access to printing presses, have access to distribution that was already locked in, had institutional connections. People have been able to reach many people for years. But now what's happened is the lowly individual doesn't have to claw, crawl their way up through Hollywood, doesn't have to crawl their way up through the New York City media establishment. You can write and 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you can reach anyone on planet Earth with an internet connection. And once I realized that, I said, I got to get good at this. Yeah. So what are some of the, uh, do you have any like really quick things that you knew that you were doing like really, really poorly or some things that you were just, you weren't doing period that you were able to implement really, really quickly? 
Yeah, so I'll do a couple simple things and then I'll do one complicated thing. Please. So a couple simple a couple simple things was a lot of people's writing, including my own, isn't descriptive. And the person who I would read here is just read like a couple pages, but go read David Foster Wallace. Mm -hmm. Go read his writing. What David Foster Wallace, he can say more in a sentence than I used to be able to say in a year. The descriptiveness and the sharpness of his words was something that I always admired. So, so, what so I you do, made it through Infinite Jest? Oh no, I haven't. Oh, I, okay, there's I was going to uh, say, good. No, no, no. Did that. I've I, I've read I've probably read a hundred pages of David Foster Wallace because oh. his writing is actually too much stimulation for my brain. I can't do David Foster Wallace, but mm -hmm. I wanted to borrow some of what he had because I didn't have that. And mm -hmm. so what I always ask myself is, say I write a sentence like, "My business did really well last year." Mm -hmm. Then what I always try to do is say, "Explain three times." Okay, my business did really well last year. Explain. I grew my business by 80% last year. Explain. I grew my business by 80% last year to $500,000 in revenue. Great. That is such a better sentence than my business did really well last year. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing that I would say, specificity. The second thing I like, I don't want to step in a row, but like this works if like you're writing an email to your boss. You know, like this works if you're mm -hmm. if you're adding a line in a resume like this is beyond Twitter. This is just life. So totally. I, just wanted to, I just wanted to say that. So go on. Absolutely. So then the second thing is I do not think about writing like anyone I know. Mm -hmm. Most like think of your writing classes. What mm -hmm. what do you remember? You remember the okay. schoolhouse no rock, no. right? <laughs> but but like remember those schoolhouse rocks like conjunction junction. Mm -hmm. What's yeah, your yeah. function? Cook it right. So like most of school writing is grammar and syntax. And then we're like, why don't people like writing? Well, guess what? You write for mm -hmm. one person from when you're like it, five years old to all the way through college, you're just writing for your professor. And so the way I think about writing is very holistically, not people think of writing as something that you do. You sit down at a page and you just look at this cursor in front of you. And I'm like, that's not like, you know what that's like? That's like, thinking that an ice cream is just the cherry on top like mm -hmm. an ice cream has a whole supply chain it has a people who serve you it has the taste in your mouth it has the associations that you have with ice cream even ice cream in if, if, it'd be like working the ice cream industry and only focusing on the thing that people eat there's so much stuff with ice cream likewise Writing is similar. You got to live a life that contributes to good ideas. You have to have conversations to know which ones of your ideas are interesting. You have to take notes so that most people think of taking notes as saving ideas. I think of taking notes as actually time travel of transporting yourself to a, a, a state of consciousness that you were in like five, five months ago, five years ago, going back, remembering that fish that you had in Prague on that beautiful evening, and then bringing that into your writing. And then that's all the stuff that happens before. And then how do you actually distribute your writing? And so I guess I'll close here. Like, I don't think of writing as something that just is like typing at the keyboard. They give grammar and syntax. I think of writing as like a way of life. And the words on the page are just a mechanism for expressing what you're thinking, how you're living and how you see the world. Gotcha. So it's almost like you have to put in the experience, the work, whatever it is before you're even putting pen to paper. Exactly. Yeah. Totally. I mean, my, like, I don't even call myself a writer. I just mm -hmm. live, try to have lots of interesting ideas. And then writing is just how I communicate. But I don't define myself as a writer at all. I, I've never read Ernest Hemingway, but it, like from what I know about him stereotypically, it feels like a very Ernest Hemingway approach hmm. to writing. I'll with take the no compliment. Idea, Thank you. <laughs> uh, which I don't really, like I said, I've never read, but I, I know a little bit about him. All right, so what, uh, how did you get started tweeting? And like, why are you so good at tweeting? Well, I got started tweeting. So I was going to, I grew up in San Francisco, where I am now, and I grew up in a city, of course, and so I had access to all these interesting people and ideas and stuff like that. And what happened was I went to college in North Carolina. I was in a college of town of 5,000 people, and there wasn't a lot happening. And I was a horrible student. And so what happened was, so I was a horrible student, but I was interested in the world. I always had very kind of like adult interests, and I've always loved just hanging out with people way older than me. And I felt very frustrated and unable to tap into whatever was happening out there 
mm-hmm. not in my small town. Mm-hmm. And so what happened was I had a friend in high school. His name was Avi Stricker. 2011, he told me to download Twitter. I went on. I said, what is this thing? I'm not going to use it. It was probably until spring of 2014 that I really started to use it. And there was a guy named Mark Andreessen. Mark Andreessen founded Netscape, the first internet browser, and is one of the big names of Silicon Valley. He currently sits on the board of Facebook, an advisor to Mark Zuckerberg, and runs a venture capital firm called Andreessen Horwitz. And I would sit on my bed at my college house called Margaritaville, and I would have Mark Andreessen's thoughts coming on my phone. And I said, oh my goodness, you can have the thoughts of the smartest people in the world, no matter where you are. And we know this intellectually, but to understand it experientially was life-changing for me. And once I had Mark Andreessen's thoughts on my phone, I realized, well, I'm going to consume, consume, consume. And once I started tweeting, I just tried to put out into the world what I liked consuming. Mm -hmm. So basically, all my tweets are, what do I wish was on my feed? And basically take the 90 percentile or higher and only tweet those. And yeah. so what I do is I just try to raise the quality of my own feed. I, w- I want my own feed to be the most interesting thing in the world. And I just try to make what I would like to consume. Yeah, I, I, I do the same thing in, in that, like, the first person you have to please is yourself. And so you know when something's good and you kind of know when something's bad or salesy or whatever that is. Uh, like, even doing it for a brand, like, there's stuff that you put out that you realize that, like, no one cares about this. And then there's stuff that you write that you're like, I'm legitimately proud of this. And, uh, and I always kind of say, like, I don't really care about the stats as much. I care more about, like, am I proud to put this out? And, uh, and that's like, you know, the stats tell you if you're kind of going in the right direction or not. But they're like, you can kind of feel it in your gut if it's something good and that's going to resonate or not. It's like a dance, man. You know, yeah. it's a dance between you and your audience. You're putting out new ideas then you're seeing where your audience responds to, you're moving, you're jiving with it, and you keep going there and you're trying to lead your audience, but then also respond to where are they comfortable, where aren't they comfortable. I like that, that's a clever way to put it, is like you're dancing and you're leading, but you still have to have your partner want you to lead. Exactly. All right, let me try to go through some of these questions. Let me see if I can, do we do, Jesus, we have a lot. Um, uh, okay. And they should pop up the bottom. There you go. Uh, I think this means, what does starting niche mean? So one of the things that me and you talked about was like, start real specific um, and even kind of maybe like stay specific. So what does that mean to you? Well, I actually thought you explained this better than I've ever seen it explained before. I just um, did it with a circle. That was it. It was two circles. I know. It was so elegant, man. You crushed it. Um, well, how about this? Why don't, why don't I riff on it for a second and then you jump in and help? Because well, you're definitely niche too. Like yeah, you have certain well, things that you talk about. I have one thing that I will sort of start and then you uh-huh. can sort of take what I say. I would say that I would think of what are the things that rile you up, that fire you up, that get you mm-hmm. excited to be alive, that activate your, your brain and your imagination. And what you will find is in, for example, write a passage. We have this exercise called our 12 favorite problems. Mm -hmm. And it comes from Richard Feynman, a famous Nobel Prize winning scientist. And his idea was that you write down your 12 favorite problems and then you just keep them lingering in your mind. And then all of a sudden, boom, because it's sort of in the back of your mind, you find an answer out of nowhere. And then other people look at you and they say, how did that person figure it out. They must be a genius. We do this in Rite of Passage, and we Mm -hmm. do it for one particular reason. We have everybody write down their 12 favorite questions. And what you find is people who say, oh, I have no interests. They're like, wait, I have so many interests. And people are like, oh, I'm interested in everything. They're like, wait, actually, all my interests center around a couple different themes. Mm -hmm. And so I actually think writing and finding your niche happens and this is why i always encourage people to write about what they're excited about because people inherently aren't excited about everything and if they are they have a way of talking about those things that is niche and so i would say write what you're excited about don't let this obsession with being niche stop you from writing in the first place because for a lot of people niche actually emerges but you have a more deliberate way of figuring out how to write niche and so i'll let you run with that 
Yeah, I did, it's honestly not that different than what you did. It's it, the it, you just have to start real specific and then get wider and wider and wider. It's kind of starting with like the smallest viable audience. It's like if you release a product, you just need a you, you need a how many what's the minimum number of customers that you could have that would make the business or the product viable. It's the same with having a Twitter following or just any social media following. So figure out something that you're passionate about. But th that's the part that I don't think I stressed enough uh, when we talked last time is like, if I don't care about cricket, I shouldn't be writing about cricket. You know, right. like you have to find something that you are absolutely passionate about. And what works for you and I think what works for me is I'm interested in creativity. I'm interested in, you know, human nature and stuff. So it's easy to tweet about it. It doesn't feel like work. It feels like a hobby. You know, it's no different than like if you love golf, going to play golf. Uh, so like, I think that's where you start. Start with whatever it is that you're interested in and start applying the principles of better writing and go from there. And then you got to follow people who are interested in the same thing. And uh, you might be so specific, so niche, that there's no one else doing what you're doing. But there's going to be people like in the periphery that are doing similar things. Yeah, spot on. I mean, it's funny because you talked about golf. And one of the things that you'll find is that things are way bigger than they seem. So if you start writing about social media, for example, you'll say, oh, my goodness, there's this infinite complexity to social media. And you'll say, you, you know, other people be like, oh, Matthew, you know, like at, a, at Thanksgiving, oh, he's the guy who works in the social media industry. You know, it's this mm -hmm. new emerging field. And then you get into it. You're like, well, I do social media for businesses. I'm really interested mm -hmm. in with my personal account, how to work with brands, this sort of relationship between philosophy and humor and then teaching and then how to actually build a following on social media. But you're not really interested in social media marketing. You're not really interested in social media for nonprofits, right? And mm -hmm. so you get into it, you're like, wow, this is so big. And I think that that is why I always just encourage people to dive in and how do we do that? I'll get into the next question of how do you get over writer's block? Well, there's a couple things that I would focus on. I have an idea that I call start from abundance. And so basically what you want to do is, you know, it's criminal, absolutely criminal. We don't teach kids how to take notes. You know, like you got a college, you spend four years observing ideas. And what do you do at the end of every semester? You got your notebooks. I'm never going to need these again. <laughs> Throw it away. It's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. What you should do is build a digital note taking system for all of you. I recommend a platform called Building a Second Brain. It's the name of a course by my partner, Tiago Forte. And the reason I, he's my partner is because it changed my life. And I said, Tiago, we got to be business partners. And so this is what I give everyone in Rite of Passage. First week, you build a note taking system. Nothing else matters at the beginning. So then so should people be taking notes right now? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. All of you should be taking notes, hopefully digitally. Yeah. And then what you do when you sit down to write is basically I have two screens. Okay. So I just take notes, take notes, take notes. And then on the left side of my screen, I have all my notes. And on the right side, I have a blank page. So when you have writer's block, you are just trying to come up with ideas at a computer. I cannot think of a less creative place than a computer. I mean, you're looking at a screen, you're sedentary, you're you, you have to be there for hours. You're probably tired. You're probably slightly bored. You're probably regretting what you're writing about. Go come up with ideas when you're reading in conversations, when you're out in the world, capture those ideas, bring them to your computer and have writing be much more like a collage of taking existing assets, pulling them into what you're writing. Then I'm going to try to be like Hemingway and come up with ideas on the spot. That's where all these people go, go wrong. Guys, you shouldn't have writer's block. You're just doing it wrong. I love it. Honestly, I think that's something that I ended up in, like, just by accident doing where, and I don't have a great system. I just know that whenever I see something interesting, I go, oh, crap, I'm going to write this down. And I just go to my notes. And that's why, like, so for me, writer's block is like, there are times where, like, I don't have anything, but I can go to this whole thing of notes that I've got and say, like, oh, yeah, I remember kind of this idea. And it was 75% baked. I'll just sit here for five minutes and bake the other 25% and then just put it out. Yeah, you know what I do, man? So I write, um, I just write ideas right after I have the experience. So I was going down to Washington, D.C. in September, mm -hmm. and I sat down next to this woman on a train. And we started talking, and she was probably 80 years old. She wanted nothing to do with me. And I was just like, you know what? You don't want to talk to me. You don't even want me to sit in this seat, but we're going to have a really good conversation. It was just a challenge to myself. 
And we started talking about uh, about just about life. She was just reading a novel and 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 slowly but surely began to warm up to me. And all of a sudden she's she she starts talking about how, how her husband died three years ago. She just lost one of her daughters. Then she was in North Carolina. She was like, oh, I've had all this bad karma. I'm going to move up to Connecticut, moves up to Connecticut. Her cat dies in the transportation of going up there. And we're sitting there and I'm just, I'm not going to talk to this woman ever again, but I think very often in life you have your deepest conversations with strangers, people who you're meeting for the first time and you know, you're never going to meet again. And she was going, she had her, her, her therapist had convinced her to start online dating. And so she was going down to Philadelphia and she was going to get off the, the, the train to go meet Victor. And they were going to go spend some time in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And so I'm going down to DC and it's like my responsibility to sort of like take her bag, get her off the train, make sure she's all good. And then I had another hour just to get down to DC. She got right off the train and I just wrote down the entire experience and turned it into a post. And to the point about taking notes is you want to take those notes while they're fresh in your mind. And it was just one of those experiences that I knew was something that I wanted to save and to cherish because it was so, so deep, so human. And that's then what you want to do. So that next one week later, when I came back to actually write that post, I had these very vivid details of like the, the, the jewelry on her hand, the color of her hair, the, the kind of novel that she was reading, the way she looked at me, the, the, the bandaid over her nose, all those sorts of things. I love it. That, that, that's great advice. It, it kind of reminds me of something we talked about too, of just like riding the wave of motivation or when you, when you're in it, like you kind of lose it. Like it, it's not, uh, you know, it, it's ephemeral. It goes away. So grab it when you get a chance. All right. Uh, one thing. So someone talked about this. Uh, one piece of advice that you had, I think that was really, really good. And I think this goes for uh, a lot of people who don't have a big following that want a bigger following. Uh, this isn't something that I do, but it's something that you, you know, that you've been able to explicitly say. Talk to me a little bit about replying to popular tweets and how that's helped you or how that can help anyone. You want to share your Twitter story from this week? I honestly think that's yeah. the best story there is. It is, but it, the, the problem is when you- so You your, did it. Your, your <laughs> advice is to like uh, reply, like there's a thoughtful tweet that's real popular and reply with like something thoughtful of value underneath it. Uh, I don't know that I did anything of value or thoughtful underneath it, but, uh, but the example that you gave, was, or the, the example that we're talking about is Twitter, they're playful. Like Twitter, the, the like the handle brand. Twitter on Twitter. And they said, you need a haircut, send us a selfie. I got very lucky. I have a friend who, as a joke, was watching one of these Instagram lives, redid my avatar with like my hair really, really big because it looked really stupid that day. And so I just had that. And see, it's getting stupid now. And so when they did it, I just replied with like this ridiculous drawing of me with really big hair and just replying to Twitter just with that one picture. I don't even think I said anything. I got I think I got 350,000 impressions on that just from replying to it. I could have been nobody. Uh, and so that's really what you were saying. So you talked about it. And then the next day, I think I texted you is like, oh, speaking of your strategy, here's what I just did. So go a little go a little more in depth. That's my my, you know, two minutes with it. What what's the like, what's your system? How do you do it? Well, how do you recommend someone to do it if they've never done it before? Yeah. So what you find is there's certain tweets that let's see how this works. We're just going to play with an idea and mm -hmm. see where it goes. This might be a total flop. But yeah. when you read something, so when you read like a scientific paper, say that you are reading about, about a new development for an asteroid belt all the way in outer space. So if you were to read that, if you're like me, I took one astrophysics class in high school, I would probably understand about 10% of what is being said. So basically, most of what's being said is going over my head. And I just don't have the tapestry of knowledge, the intellectual glue to get these ideas to stick and for me to think about them well. Then as you work your way up, you understand more and more. So you work around finance. So if you read an article about the New York Stock Exchange, you might understand 80% of that article. Mm -hmm. You might not understand something about shorts and puts, but you might understand a lot about the actual culture of what it's like on the stock exchange floor. But then if you read about 
how to grow an audience on Twitter, you actually understand 150% of what's being said because you don't just understand what is being communicated. You have a whole tapestry of knowledge that you're beginning to connect the dots with. Mm -hmm. So now back to popular tweets. When you find a tweet that sparks an epiphany, why does that epiphany happen? It's because you understood more than 100% of what was being said. You had some kind of background knowledge that contributed and enhanced your understanding of that tweet. When that happens, you want to share something. So what's coming to mind is last week, you wrote something about market research that reminded me of a quote from David Ogilvy. So I came in, shared that quote, which enhanced your tweet. And that's what I always want to do. Of I wouldn't say reply with something thoughtful or something smart. Do something that enhances the tweet and improves the enjoyment of the feed. So in your example, Twitter tweeted something and you came back with something funny, something mm -hmm. that resembled the playfulness of the brand. What I'm saying is most of the people I follow are intellectuals. So I just try to add to the intellectualism of what is being said. So I, I think this is a good lesson then. If you're someone with not a lot of followers and you're looking to get more, you're looking to even just get noticed or have conversations, the best way to stand out is to reply to the people that you want to get on their, on their radar with something that adds to what they said. Absolutely. All right, let me find another question here. This one seems general, but I'll see if you, if you can riff on it. Uh, we, I always say provide value. You always say provide value, but like, what does that mean? How do we define it a little better, a little more carefully? Yeah, compression. What does that mean? What you want to do when you share ideas is compress knowledge for people. So take Einstein. Einstein spent his life studying light and gravity and the structure of the universe, trying to build upon Newtonian physics and try to make sense of some of the gaps in the world. He spent years and years of sleepless nights of walking through Austria, scratching his head, frustrated by his inability to make sense of the universe. And after all that time, he had an equation of E equals MC squared. That's it. Mm -hmm. And that's what I mean by compression. You go out into the world and you spend all of this time learning and researching and making mistakes. And then what you do is you just synthesize that idea into a very simple sentence, a very simple tweet. That's what you want to do on Twitter. So a very tactical, a very tangible example of this. Mm -hmm. A couple of weeks ago, I, so I just hired a personal assistant and I was reading the onboarding material, 25 minutes to read this material of how to do a 360 delegation. At the end, it had a three-step process with 30 questions that I should ask. I had three screenshots in the tweet, and I said, if you ever ask somebody else to do something for you, follow what's in these three screenshots. What I did was I took 30 minutes of my life and created something that would take you 10 seconds to read. That's compression, that's mm -hmm. adding value, and that goes back to Einstein and E equals MC squared. Same basic principle. I, th I think there's two components too to being able to do that. One is you have to understand something so specifically and so comprehensively that it becomes simple to explain. Like that's really, really hard to do something so simply means you really, really understand. The people that explain things complex, like that are too complex, like. I don't, under, I don't think that they understand it. It's like, if you can't explain it to me, I don't know that you really get it. It's right. the ability to explain it to me. The other thing is practice. You're, not, you're, gonna, you're gonna synthesize some stuff, you're gonna compress some stuff, and it's not gonna hit the mark sometimes. You know, you're gonna get better and better and better at it. Uh, I even had one today that I, I had this idea, wanted to post it, and uh, I posted it, and I was like, ah, that wasn't quite what I wanted to say. Uh, so, you know, like, it, it's gonna happen forever. But, uh, you know, like, there's a good chance that what I posted today would have made me really, really happy six months ago, but I've just done it so much and practiced so much that uh, now it's like, it makes, you know, it doesn't make me cringe, but it's like, oh, I should have changed that one little thing or I could have mm -hmm. added this other idea and they're a little better. Um, all right, here's one that we talked about last time. Reading books or listening to books and more importantly, why? Because I think you have an answer. Yes, I have a strong answer here. So 
Uh, I think that there's no question that if you read a book, you will retain it better than listening to a book. Mm -hmm. Almost no question. Now, they are not, it's sort of a false equivalency because when you're listening to a book, it's not like you're listening to a book walking around the house. That's the time where you're commuting. It's time where you're walking outside. So I think of listening to book books as enhanced time. So it's additive, right? Mm -hmm. Listening to books doesn't take away from time spent reading. Now, when you do listen to a book, you want to be smart about what kinds of books you listen to. You want to listen to books that are very clearly written, generally with some kind of story arc where you can get enthralled in the story and the arc of the narrative. And you want to read books that are older books, that are books that require thinking. And I say that you want to read those books because I think that in the premise of this question, there's a fundamental misconception of what reading is. What's great about reading is that in a conversation, we can't go retrieve what I said 10 minutes ago here. Mm -hmm. We can't go back and listen to it unless we watch a recording. What's great about reading is you read, you read, you read, you go back and you go revisit certain things. When I read, I go, Shh, okay, I didn't quite understand that. I go way back. It's really hard to do that with audio. And with certain sentences and ideas and paragraphs, you need to get them in your head and cycle through them over and over and over. There's a great lecture on YouTube that I love. 45 minutes on one paragraph of Nietzsche. 45 mm. minute, one paragraph. Mm -hmm. you, you can't just listen to that. You, you, you cycle through it. And that's what deep thinking really is. And so I think listening is fine. It's additive. You shouldn't feel guilty about it. But don't go try to listen to Shakespeare. Don't go try to listen to Immanuel Kant because those texts are made to be read. And that's because they're hard to parse and hard to synthesize. Whereas a book like Atomic Habits, which, which, which has no friction from the words on the page to what actually enters your mind. Yeah, just listen to it. Mm -hmm. Right. Let's see what else we got here. Um, okay. So we talked about. This one I actually don't think we kind of mentioned it. You talked about it, it was like the dark matter of Twitter. Yeah. Uh, Talk a little bit about DMs and then talk about the best way if someone wanted to DM you, for example, or if you're trying to DM someone to get their attention, what do you do? Yeah. Okay. A start couple with things the dark, to say Start here. with the dark matter thing first. Yeah. Okay. So that. Twitter or direct messages are the dark matter of Twitter. So mm -hmm. let me just explain what dark matter is. We know that there's something in the universe that comprises like 80 to 85% of what's happening in the universe. And we don't know what it is. Like we see it in the gravitational pull of different stars and it's very confusing what's going on there. Scientists don't know. And we don't, we can't define what that is. So we just call it dark matter. We know it's there, can't define it. Twitter DMs are the same thing. Like the vast majority of benefit that you get from Twitter is in direct messages, but none of us see other people's direct messages. So you got just it. don't know that that's the case. So Twitter DMs, what's amazing about Twitter is on Twitter, you can reach 50, 80% of the people in any field, basically. The top people are going to be on Twitter. Mm -hmm. So how do you actually use direct messages? Well, let me tell you. First thing you got to know is I'm not a very important person. I've accomplished almost nothing in life. And I probably reach, I probably get 10 cold emails or direct messages every day. So I can't possibly respond to all those uh, with the time and care that I would like to. So with that said, you got to assume that, I mean, imagine if you're actually reaching out to an important person you got to assume that they're 10 times, 100 times busier than you, meaning mm -hmm. every word matters. So what you want to do is you want to tell them, have a personalized message that's short, that's direct to the point, and tell them exactly what you're asking for. You know, a lot of people are like, oh, you know, I'm going to ask for coffee, and then we'll build a relationship, and then I'll ask for something. 
honestly a busy person just wants to know exactly what you're asking for. It's really counterintuitive, but I'm almost giving you permission to just use people provided that it's for good reason. Okay. I know that that's very weird advice, but it's actually true. I'd rather you just tell me, I just want your help with this. First thing. Well, you're getting used either way. And I don't mean in a bad way. Like no one's reaching out to you just because they don't want anything. Or just, even if they just want to have coffee with you, they still want to be in someone's presence and, and just be around them. Uh, so, so I think if anything, it's, it's almost being polite by saying, here's exactly what I'm looking for. Are you interested? Yes or no? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I'm trying to figure out how to frame this properly. But like the thing is, say that you want to to meet Matthew and you're trying to reach out to me to say, Hey, can you have an intro? Like for me to make an intro to you, if it's someone who I think is legit, it costs me 30 seconds of my time and it could make a huge difference for you. I'm happy to do that if it's really worth it for you. Right? Like I'm basically betting that somebody is worth your time. Now with that said, if you ask me to go get lunch and hang out for five hours before I mean, then you're taking five hours of my time in order to do that. And I don't want that. Like, I want to help you, but I want it to be quick. And I want to make sure that you're legit. So let me talk about the legit part. So what you want to do is you want to somehow prove that you are worth helping. So, I mean, the first thing is to engage on the feed through replies and through conversations and to show me in public that you are really interesting. Like there's a guy you guys can go look up and his name is Simon Saris. Like we haven't really engaged. We've kind of engaged back and forth. I think he's really interesting. And if he reached out to me, I'd hop on the phone with him right away. Cause we're, cause he's doing stuff in public. He has no idea that I'm a big fan of what he's doing. Mm -hmm. And that's what you want to do. You want to set the, the, the relationship in public, talk back and forth, then dive into the DMS. Once again, be specific and then, yeah, just be super deliberate about what you're asking for. Oh, and one more thing is make sure that you have some kind of professional profile. So if you just have the normal Twitter avatar, it doesn't show me that you're really invested in this platform, that you've done the work, that you have something to lose, and that you're professional. Whereas if you have a nice profile picture, a nice bio, and I can see that you're clearly up to something, I'll be much more likely to help you out. Yeah. Also, too, don't write something that's this long when, <laughs> when this long will do. That's, that's just, I get these and I'm like, oh, that's a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because you feel an obligation to write something really long back. Oh, no, I don't. I feel an obligation to, uh, um, to read it. <laughs> I just don't want to <laughs> read the whole thing sometimes. I, I, now, my, my, I, I think some of my, and I'll use charm very loosely here because I don't know if it's charm. But some of my charm is that some <laughs> of my responses are so short and to the point. Like I've had people tell me that like, I lucky that you're so uh, uh, like just to, you know, you're just matter of fact. And it's like, I guess that, you know, and so if someone writes something really long and I can, and I'm not trying to like be short purposefully or be short to be mean. It's that like, if it, if it you know, if it took you this long to, to send something and it just took me this long to answer everything that you had, I'm, I'm not going to use any more words than I need to. Mm -hmm. I think that's what kind of goes like that. That's just how the way that I approach Twitter, just because I think it's an effective way to communicate. Um, and so I, I just tend to do it all the time. All right, this should be a fun one. Do you have any of these? Book recommendations? Mm -hmm. I don't even care what the subject is. If, if you want to say it's to make you a better writer or to make you better at Twitter. Yeah, I got um, one recommendation. Or if you just it's something you like, whatever. Yeah, I'm going to just go off the beaten path. Mm -hmm. There's a guy named Christopher Alexander, and he is an architect who has had a big influence in the software community. And I just he, – he has this book called The Timeless Way of Building, which is just magnificent. And there's a really interesting thing that's happening with three books that I want to figure out what's going on here. But yeah. they're all trying to get at the same thing through different lenses. So there's the Tao Te Ching, the famous – book from that sort of has these east asian philosophies mm -hmm. and the tao Te Ching says the tao cannot be named then there is the timeless way of building which is a book about architecture and how to design spaces that are enjoyable that give life to what's happening and once again it has a that thing that cannot be named quality 
And then there is a book called Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, which mm -hmm. tries to, which is about what Robert Persick calls the metaphysics of quality. He, the, the, the whole book is about what is quality and it's a very philosophical book, very philosophical, philosophical question. And once again, it gets into this thing that cannot be named idea. And so back to Christopher Alexander, the reason that I recommend that book is for any of you who design experiences, who make products, who just want to think about the spaces that you inhabit. His book talks about architecture in a way that's very spiritual, in a way that's very easy to access with no jargon. And you will never see the spaces that you inhabit in the same way again. So The Timeless Way of Building by Christopher Alexander, that man is has just a beautiful mind. I love it. The, uh, uh, and to kind of build off what you're saying too, uh, some of the way that I approach what I do, and I think that a lot of people approach what they do, is when you look back at really old texts, we know them for a reason. You know, like they've stood the test of time. So there's something good there. And, uh, and we haven't really changed that much. You know, like we've been around for 100,000, a million years, whatever it is, uh, as, uh, as humans. Uh, and like, so you have wisdom that's only 2,000 years old. That's like, really, that, you know, like, it's just this like tiny little sliver. And so if you can take something um, that, you know, like not, my point is that not much has changed in the 2000 years since it was really written. So you can apply other people who have thought much harder, much deeper, much more eloquently and apply to something like social media, apply to something like motorcycles, apply to like something to architecture. And all of a sudden you've like completely opened up this other way of thinking about something, which you don't even have to think harder about. Like that's why I like the, you know, looking at things through a human nature or a philosophical lens is it's like someone else has already done all the hard work like I, all i've got to do is like put an instagram filter on this and now it looks beautiful yeah you know i want to build off of that point yeah that's exactly what i'm doing with say an essay like I, i'm writing an essay called teaching like a state i'm mm -hmm. just taking the ideas from a book called seeing like a state and mm -hmm. i'm like wait that actually applies perfectly to teaching and so i just take an existing idea and i just change the context of it and boom, same thing. I was drafting an article, an essay last night, and I was – so I'm, I'm, I'm making a camp, a summer camp for 10 to 12-year-olds. So we're working through the curriculum, and I'm trying to build the philosophy behind this. And in education, there's a big issue of should we do top-down or, or should we do bottom-up? And the problem is with, eight, with, with 10 to 12-year-olds, if you do two top-down, you don't let kids play. That's a problem. If you do two bottom-up, well, kids are just going to roam, and they're going to do nothing but play. So how do you synthesize those two things? So it's like, okay, I'm going to look at New York architecture. I, I, I made this connection. There's Robert Moses, who had a very top-down idea. He's, he's, he's the guy who built New York and all the highways he built and stuff like that. I was like, okay, we don't want that. Then there's Jane Jacobs, who's like all bottom-up. I'm like, we don't want that. Then there is a, the guy who in 1811 designed the grid for New York. And I think the grid created the perfect mix of life and vitality that makes New York City great, but also with the order and the structure that makes New York City as productive as it is. And mm -hmm. so I'm like, maybe the grid is the perfect top down and bottom up. And I'm going to use that as a metaphor. His name is Governor Morris. And so all I've done is I'm just taking existing ideas, applying it to new contexts, things that are obvious to me, amazing to others. And if I can find that obvious to me, amazing to others idea, then I know it's a good thing to write about. I, if you ever follow my tweets, one thing, I, I use the word steal a lot, and I do it because I know it's kind of incendiary. Uh, but this is exactly what I mean. Like, this is what I'm talking about when I say steal. Like, you don't steal the grid system. You steal the inspiration of what it means to have a grid system in New York City and apply it to somewhere else. So, love it. We're doing a horrible job of getting through a lot of questions. We're, we're, <laughs> I'm we're rambling. Um, all right. What do you think about running a Twitter account or any social media account with a pseudonym? Big fan. What it, why do you recommend Big it? fan. I recommend it for people who, I was talking to a friend yesterday who works for one of the biggest public companies in the world. He is, he asked me for some writing advice and just a really smart guy. And he has so many good ideas. And if he writes under his real name, he might get fired right under a pseudonym. And guess what? Even if you write under a pseudonym, provided that it's well done and you can go on my article or on my on my blog and you can look at the article why you should write under a pseudonym. I have what I call create a character and take a stand. Those are the two things that you need to have a successful pseudonym. So basically what that means is make a character. 
you know, what's been really popular and fashionable is to be inspired by a Roman god or mm. anything like that. You have a lot of Marcus Aurelius. I I've noticed a lot of Greek philosophers have uh, yes. pseudonymous accounts. Yes. So the one, if I were to start one, well, actually, I'm not going to say that because then you would know it's me. But I have, yeah, uh, <laughs> I, I was talking to a friend last week and we were talking, ah, should we do it? So I have another one that I think is, you know, it'd be really interesting. The Greek Roman thing is kind of, is kind of tired, but you can start another one. So let's create a character, have a character, a way of speaking, a way of talking. That's fun. And then also take a stand, have something that you believe in, have something that you're fighting for, have something that is a strong enough opinion that you can't say it under your real name. Cause that's what makes writing under a pseudonym worth it. And I'll tell you, even if you write under a pseudonym, you do those two things well, you'll be able to meet the people that you want to meet to have the influence that you want to have. And we're going to see, yeah, I mean, look at, look at probably the most important thing written in the century was arguably the Satoshi Nakamoto white paper that's mm -hmm. written by a pseudonym and yeah. that has moved asset prices by, by billions of dollars. Yeah. That's uh, he's talking about Bitcoin. If you're not familiar. Yes. Uh, which, which the power of that is, you do it so it's a, a pseudonym, so no one can go after that person if the government doesn't like it. And then it's a decentralized network, so you can't stop it if you don't like it. Like that's the, that, that's the uh, benefit of, of doing it that way. All right, um, let's see here. Isn't value subjective? All right, um, I don't know. This one, isn't value subjective on Twitter? No. Yeah, that's, that's an easy one. No, it's just, no, I'm fine with it. No, I, I, I mean, I have a very strong opinion on this. When you're just consuming stuff, you're like, oh, value is subjective. The second that you start creating anything, you realize that value or value and quality is not subjective. There are absolutely objective ways to do things better and worse. And I'm going to be objective about this. People yeah. who say that value is purely subjective are just dead wrong. Yeah, not good with me. What, uh, what do you see people doing on Twitter that makes you cringe? Hashtags, just mm -hmm. ridiculous. Hashtags mm -hmm. and tagging a million people in your tweets these yeah. desperate cries for attention. I, mm -hmm. It it, uh, it just shows. It just shows. Build your audience. Build, build things slowly. Like things that build slowly are sustainable. Mm -hmm. And it, it, you can just see when somebody who has 30 followers and tr wants to get to 30,000 tomorrow. What's great about building things slowly is things that build slowly. They compound over time. You're building trust. You're building a reputation. Be okay with building your audience slowly. Now, that doesn't mean that you aren't going to take action. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying take deliberate action, do things well, build a kick-ass audience, know it's going to take a couple years, but also then by the time that you have your audience, I now, for example, I have more than 20,000 email subscribers. I have relationships with each of those 20,000 people, many of whom I've, who've now been reading my work for years. The, the, that is an incredible asset. Yeah, completely agree. I've got nothing to add. Let's try this one. Yeah, you do more of these than me, so I'm going to let you answer this one. Yeah, so Twitter threads, a couple things. First tweet is a sales pitch for the rest of your thread. So the mm -hmm. first tweet should inspire curiosity, and it should make people want to read the rest of the thread first. Second is make sure that the tweets... I would try to have the tweets stand on their own, meaning tweet three, four, seven. You could mm -hmm. read them and still get value without knowing the other tweets. I, then, I, totally, I totally agree with you on that one. It, I don't do it that often, but when I do, I do it more for a, a brand than I do for myself. But yep. I try to make it each tweet is a separate idea. And then if they saw just that one, there's yep. still going to be enough. Like it's not going to be so out of context that it wasn't make any sense. But that like, you get one little piece of nugget, one little hit, and, and that's, you know, I just think it's a good rhythm too, but sorry, so go on. Exactly. So that's where I would start. And then also I would think about just working under a central theme and you can kind of be schizophrenic with your ideas where you could say, this is what I think the future of education looks like and sort of take ideas that aren't really linearly connected, but are part of a central theme and just bundle them all together into a thread. A Twitter thread should just be easy to read. I mean, that's like, if there's anything on Twitter, you want to just provide a lot of value in a way that's really easy to consume. It's kind of that simple.
Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And honestly, even outside of Twitter, no matter what you're doing, make yeah. it easy to consume. Like, it's just the rule with life. Like, even outside of social media, like, why would you write an email that's hard to consume? Um, yeah. All right. Are we worried? So let's say that we do. Let's say that everyone takes our advice. And all of a sudden, everyone's just posting all this uh, stuff on Twitter. Is there going to be an issue with like too much content to consume on Twitter ever? No, 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 no. Uh, first of all, people aren't going to take this advice, and if you do, you have a huge advantage. Mm -hmm. And and if that happens, that all these people take our advice, Twitter will become a much more enjoyable platform. And yeah. if I get less reach because people are now so good at Twitter and my rate of learning goes way up, I'm happy to, to, to make that trade. And look, we have algorithms because every, look, this is how the internet has always worked. This is how things of abundance work, right? If you go back to, to the internet, you used to have Yahoo, which was just a directory where you could find every single website on a single page. And you could go, business, here are all the blogs. And then what happened was we needed Google. We needed a search mechanism to sort through all of what was happening. And what happens when you get to abundance is the actual structure of discovery begins to change. Another quick example here is with Facebook, where Facebook used to be a linear feed up until like mm -hmm. 2013, 14. It was a super controversial decision in the company to launch what was called Newsfeed. And there was an algorithm, a way of weighting different kinds of content. Twitter made the same thing. They moved from a, what's called a chronological feed to an algorithmically sorted feed. And that's what will happen. So content saturation won't be a problem because algorithms are something that we're really good at as a society mm -hmm. for the most part. I get in a lot of Twitter fights for, uh, on the chronological versus algorithmic feed. I yeah, will die, I will can die on it. the algorithm hill. Me too. Me I, too. We're, it's there's, way just too much, there's just too much crap out there. Like, I, yeah. like I, I'd rather have a, a, a code sorted for me than, than have to read it. Like that's no question. The, the alternative. Yo, isn't it the best when you haven't been on Twitter in like 24 hours and you open your feed and you're like, Wow. Yeah. Uh-huh. It's phenomenal. There's so much good stuff here. All right. Um, let's see what we got here. You see that one there? Yeah. I wouldn't – look, if you can come up with 10 really good tweets in a day, do it. But I'm kind of with you. They're like, if, if every one of them is awesome, I do post every hour. Like, I, yeah. You know, if you're able to keep that up, sure. I uh, it's going to be more of an issue of coming up with that many great tweets than it is to ever overwhelm people with stuff. Yeah, exactly. All right. Um, okay. Uh, so, how, so this one. So let's say that you find someone on Twitter you're interested in. How do you build that relationship? So let's say someone sees your stuff. They're like, God, I love what he does. I want to befriend him. Um, what's something that they can do to like, keep a conversation going with you, how to like stay on your radar, what should they do? Yeah, so I just tweeted some maps that I really like. Mm -hmm. And if somebody responded and said, hey, David, here are my four favorite maps and you should go check them out or you should go follow MapsGuy806. Hey, yeah. wow, just found this. You do that three or four times, I'll start recognizing your name. Remember I spoke about Simon Saris earlier. Simon had an amazing response to one of my tweets a couple weeks ago about why black and white photos look so much better for portraits than color I photos. I saw that. I know the answer. Oh, That's such a good answer. Such a good answer. Yeah. So, I, so, so that name just popped into my head. I'm now seeing him over time. And mm -hmm. this stuff doesn't happen consciously. If, but if you just actually teach me or show me something that I wouldn't have known about otherwise. You do it a couple of times. Hey, I will be, I'll be super interested in what you have to say and you can reach out. What is that? How to win it's, friends and influence people. Yeah. So what it's funny. Mind here? I left this. Uh, so I'm back at my place in Atlanta and I left this book here because I've read it a bunch and I was like, I don't need to bring it to New York. Uh, and so I was just leaping through it again. And uh, one of the things that stuck out, I just coincidentally did it is let's see. Can you guys read that? How to make people like you instantly. And what's great about, here's why I like his book. Everyone should read this book. At the end of it, he literally like tweets the entire uh, like chapter on there. 
at the end, like he literally summarizes the whole thing. And the whole point, you want people to like you? Oh, this one's talk about surf and more, whatever. You want people to like you? Like talk about what they're interested in. It's that simple. So if you're tweeting about maps, reply about maps. Like that, that's, that's the lesson. It, it's such a simple lesson. Okay. Um, all right. Do you see this one? Yeah. Should tweets include media? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I love posting with photos. I'm really into mm -hmm. just sharing aesthetics and trying to become more appreciative of aesthetics in general. So I love posting photos of architecture and painting because I'm trying to learn about that stuff. And so I do it, but just, it really depends, right? It's like, what are you trying to say? What are you trying to do? Like last night I tweeted one trick to make your writing shorter, get to the point. Like that's mm -hmm. not a tweet that should have a photo. Mm -hmm. But if I want to share uh, I've been watching a lot of videos from a guy named Charlie Munger, who's Warren Buffett's business partner. And I've been watching a lot of videos from, from Munger. And if I want to share something about Munger, it might help to splice a minute and a half video up and share it on Twitter. I, I think a good point that uh, really is what, well, again, you could use this on any social media platform is add video, add pictures, add whatever you're adding, make sure it adds value. If you can get the same point across with a picture as without, then you don't need the picture. You know what um, it's like? You what? know what it's like? That question is like, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be critical. Um, yeah. I, I'm just trying to be observant here. That question is like trying to go to Lowe's and or Home Depot and say, hey, I need to improve my house. Should I use a hammer? Mm, well, yeah, yeah. What are you trying to improve? Are yeah. you trying to build your deck? Absolutely. Are mm -hmm. you trying to take out the trash? Then no, right? It's like these are tools and it depends on the project and you're glad that you want a hammer or that you have a hammer at your house. But if you're trying to cook dinner, no, you should not use a hammer. But yeah, yeah, yeah. if you're building the deck or hanging up a painting, absolutely mm -hmm. use a hammer. All right, let's go. So we're running out of time. This literally cuts you off in an hour, I know, because I've done it accidentally before. So All right. if I... Uh, I'll try on this last one. If we do it quickly, I'll, I'll try to sneak one more in. But who are some of the people on Twitter that you follow that have this compression thing really down? Yeah. Morgan Housel is really good. Morgan Housel is just amazing at Twitter. Mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of him. Then there is an anonymous account called Tiabut, T H I A B U T. Yeah, big how do you fan pronounce that one? I don't know how to pronounce it. I don't know, but I'm a big yeah. fan of what he does. Mm -hmm. And and then Naval Ravikant's just the best at Twitter who's ever yeah. been done. Um, he's so good at it. And all those people, they just, you know, there's there's something interesting that happens at scale. Like once you you can't just compress a long form essay into a tweet. You have to bring a long form essay down then shift the way you see it mm -hmm. like a Rubik's cube and kind of change how you see it and then mm -hmm. find a new way of presenting that idea. So that's yeah. what, what good compression is, is it's actually additive. If you write, try to write a good book summary, you can't just remove 60% of the words and have it be a summary. You actually need to change the structure of what is being said. And that's why compression is forces you to think through something because you can't, an idea isn't malleable in your brain unless you really understand it. Yeah, that I love it. Um, I'll I'll throw out a few more. Um, we've got we're I got the like notification. I've got like a seventy seconds left. Uh, dun, 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 dun. Th there's some that I, I kind of keep to myself because I, I when I share like profiles, I share ones that do uh, more social media stuff and kind of talk about the same stuff. I don't really talk about the like Naval's of the world, um, but you named him. He's obviously great. James Clear, I've talked about a lot. I've recommended his book. He's really great at synthesizing stuff. Uh, I really like Orange Book. Yeah. Orange underscore book. Uh, he's really great. Again, it's one of those people that are able to synthesize such complex stuff that it, you just kind of feel it when you see it. Um, Wealth Theory is another one. He talks about kind of investing and just how to spend money and stuff like that. But again, in a way that's very applicable. Uh, and then one other is the founder of Gumroad. His, yeah. uh, his handle is just SHL. And uh, he's, he's great too. Um, you've got 20 seconds left. Anything you want to say in 20 seconds? 
Thank you for coming, everybody. Yeah. Thank you for joining me again, guys. Uh, apparently, we can never do this where we don't go over. Uh, so stay tuned. Who knows? Maybe, maybe me and you do something again. More collab. <laughs> All right. Bye, we'll talk everybody. soon, David. Bye.